D. Uh, I guess he doesn't need uh, really an introduction, especially at, at this kind of workshop. He's one of the um, one of the you know the main drivers and organizers of, of the, the the lattice program here. Obviously, one of the pioneers of um, the mathematics underlying lattice cryptography and lattice-based uh, cryptography itself. So it's a great pleasure to have Daniele here and uh, for the first uh, talk on the connection between SIS and uh, LWE. Okay. Thank you, uh, Michele, for the introduction and inviting me here. So for a moment when you said that I didn't need an introduction, I thought you were about to say this is the third talk I'm giving in this semester. And uh, yeah, so the, the, but anyway, so just to make it uh, more varied. So this time I will give a whiteboard talk. Uh, yeah, so I can also draw slides so you can watch the videos. But uh, I think uh, that the slides are uh, for today, uh, so this will work out well. And uh, um, also, so um, a point about this issue of uh, cryptanalysis not being rewarding. I would like to add a few uh, 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 the, the clarification. Uh, cri cryptanalysis is quite rewarding. I mean, when uh, you try to break something and you break it, oh, that's very rewarding. So that the level of, uh, you know, it's really sensational, okay? And you get your, you know, best paper award, the admiration of the community. The really tricky part is when you try to cryptanalyze something which is secure <laughs> and uh, your effort uh, doesn't quite uh, produce uh, the cryptanalysis and uh, I think that it is quite uh, an issue right now for especially for quantum uh, post-quantum cryptography one of the questions that I get more often from people outside uh, this community is oh how do we know uh, that uh, lattice uh, cryptography is uh, uh, secure even against quantum computers because you know I searched around I couldn't find any single single paper showing quantum attacks to lattice cryptography. So it sounds like nobody is even trying to do it. So the problem is that uh, I think we do need a way to somehow document uh, this effort uh, that uh, I know personally from talking to people, that people have been trying to put uh, to analyze, attack, and see if it's something can be done. So even when it doesn't quite work uh, with a break, it would be useful uh, to find a way to uh, uh, yeah, have a record of, uh, of these things. But anyway, so this is more of an aside for everybody to think about. If anybody has a good uh, suggestion or idea, I think this could also be a great uh, uh, opportunity, great place to discuss, uh, to discuss that. But let's get to the matter of uh, my talk. So I'll be talking about a number of things. Let me first make a list of uh, all the various uh, uh, names and buzzwords and problems that will be mentioned in uh, my talk. So uh, I'll start with the two central problems in lattice, uh, used in lattice cryptography, which are the SIS, short integer solution problem. and the LWE problem, or learning with errors. <coughs> so uh, so these, are the two pro these are two average case problems, uh, problems where you are picking a lattice at random, and the corresponding lattice problem is uh, um, thought, is conjectured to be hard. And on one side, it is possible to give some evidence about the hardness of these problems by connecting them with certain other lattice problems that are more commonly studied and used outside of cryptography. And we'll see many of them. There is a long list of problems that I will mention but there are uh, two uh, main, so uh, among these uh, uh, we have uh, the um, uh, gap uh, SVP, the gap uh, shortest vector problem, uh, the uh, shortest uh, independent vector problem, uh, the bounded distance decoding, uh, then there's a problem that for a lack of a better name uh, some people call ADD, uh, the absolute distance decoding, uh, the shortest vector problem SVP, CVP, and more and more and so on and so on and so on. I will define uh, um, the main problems in this list. Don't worry about uh, yeah, the long list of names. But the main difference between these problems and those two is that the two problems up there are 
average case problems are problems with a probability distribution on instances. So these are standard complexity theory algorithms problems that you want to solve in the worst case. And so an algorithm that solves this problem is an algorithm that given any instance, no matter how it was chosen, and tries to produce a solution. And one of the most remarkable features of Lattice cryptography and what brought a lot of attention to these, uh, to these problems is that it is possible to connect these two classes of problems. If you can break those problems on average, then you can design algorithms for these problems that are more commonly studied in complexity theory and algorithms. So in the other on the opposite side, uh, we also have uh, cryptographic applications. So think of this as the foundation of the lattice cryptography problems, which are these two. And uh, on the application side, you can build uh, pretty much everything. However, uh, the type of, uh, so, so the first one, SIS, leads to a much smaller class of problems. From SIS, it is possible to build uh, um, symmetric key encryption. <coughs> hash functions, digital signatures, commitments, and a few more things. And uh, so while digital signatures is typically considered a public key primitive, I mean, there's a public key in a digital signature scheme, all these things, they fall uh, in a class that we can think morally as being a private key. So digital signatures is something that can be built out of any one-way functions. So it's not, something, uh, it's not something that requires the type of structure that uh, uh, is used in public key cryptography. So LWE gives a much broader class of applications, starting from public key encryption, all the way to anything you want. So one of the uh, most uh, uh, complex applications of LWE is FHE, fully homomorphic encryption, which are schemes that allow to perform computations on encrypted data. And so you, you can think of this as some kind of uh, uh, cryptopia where you can do everything you want and there is a way to do it. So my talk today will be centered around the connection between these two problems. What, uh, what do they have in common? What sets them apart? And how, they relate, how do they relate with the worst case problems? And where interestingly quantum somehow seems to be key to understanding the relation between these two problems. And uh, uh, so this is something that for people that have been working on the complexity of lattice problems uh, is uh, well known, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, it'll be interesting uh, yeah, for, for some of you to see uh, how the uh, quantum comes up in the study of the complexity of the problems. And there are some very interesting questions there. So, so does this work? Let's, this, one, oh, this one moves too. It's, uh, oh, is it? Uh, yeah, OK. Now maybe the, the eraser is part of the. It's, it's, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was working uh, too, but. <laughs> it's good I didn't take the old, uh, the old whiteboard. Uh. Uh, okay, so uh, let me start by briefly introducing uh, the, um, these problems, the lattice problems, which I, I think are the uh, best way to understand, uh, to understand uh, uh, what's really going on here. So uh, most of you probably already are already familiar with lattices, know what a lattice is, but uh, just for uh, uh, concreteness. Uh, so a lattice is a set of points uh, in Euclidean space. So geometrically, you can think of it uh, as the set of intersection points 
of an n-dimensional grid and algebraically you can describe it as the set of all integer combinations of a collection of basis vectors. So you um, Take a matrix B that uh, we can assume for simplicity is uh, a, a non singular uh, uh, um, square n by n matrix, a base for Euclidean space for Rn. And uh, instead of taking the entire linear span of B, which would be Rn, we only take the combinations of these basis vectors with integer coefficients, which uh, gives as a result a discrete set of points. OK, so, so this seems a very simple object. Uh, it is interesting, uh, especially in cryptography, when you consider these objects uh, uh, for in uh, larger dimensions. In uh, two dimensions, there is not really much cryptography you can do with, uh, uh, in two dimensions with lattices. Uh, everything is easily solvable in polynomial time. In fact, it's easily solvable by, just by looking at, uh, at the picture. And uh, uh, but so what are, so, th so I will illustrate the problems in two dimensions, and you can try to imagine how it works in n dimensions. So the classic problems on uh, lattices are uh, SVP, the shortest vector problem. Let me do this. Let me put the list. This is going to be a list of problems. So let. Uh, We'll use that for the drawing. Here we can start listing the problems. The shortest vector problem. And uh, so one of these points is, uh, say, the origin. And uh, the shortest vector problem asks, uh, uh, so given uh, uh, a lattice represented by a basis B, can you find a lattice point that is as short as possible? So you can think of putting a ball around the origin that is as small as possible, and you want a non-zero vector in it. Another classic problem is the closest vector problem. Where you are given not only a basis B, but you are also given a target vector T. And the question is to find a lattice point that is closest to the target. So you want to minimize the distance of the. So if this is the target t, you put a ball around the target. You want to find something that, that is close to the target. Now, so these are the two central most studied problems in uh, lattice algorithms and complexity. And somehow, surprisingly, we don't know how to build cryptography out of these two. So the problems which are used to build cryptographic functions are not the SVP or CVP problems. So the problems that come up in cryptography are some restricted versions of the closest vector problem that can be described as follows. One is the bounded distance decoding problem. And in the bounded distance decoding problem, you look at the general properties of the lattice. So the lattice can have a certain geometric structure. And important values that characterize the geometry of the lattice are the minimum distance between the two lattice points. So this is a discrete set. So there will not be points arbitrarily close to each other. You can look at how close can two such points be. 
and uh, if you take a ball of radius uh, one half this minimum distance, uh, these balls will be all disjoint. So you can call this, uh, uh, the radius of these uh, disjoint balls. So this is called the packing radius of the lattice. And it equals exactly half the length of the shortest vector. So lambda 1 is the mathematical symbol typically used to describe the length of the shortest vector. Half of lambda 1 is this packing radius. And BDD is a special version of the closest vector problem where the target is assumed to be within this packing radius. So think of it as closest vector problem where the target is close to the lattice. It is so close that the solution is unique. Just by construction, there will be a, at most one point within distance r from the target. So the other problem that uh, comes up in lattice cryptography is uh, the absolute distance decoding. If you have a better suggestion for the name, feel free to suggest it. So this is something that, uh, so I first uh, called the guaranteed distance decoding, and then, uh, so this is another name that can, can, came up. I'm still not quite happy with either name, but this is the idea. So you can make these balls bigger than the packing radius. Right now, there are certain points which do not belong to any ball. So they are outside. So you can keep increasing the size of these balls until they cover the entire space. And uh, once uh, they cover the entire space, I will use a big capital R letter for this bigger radius. So this is called the covering radius. So you can think of it in terms of functions as follows. So the packing radius is a radius that guarantees that given any target, there will be at most one solution to the CVP. There will be zero point if you are too far, or one solution if you are close enough, but you cannot have more than one point in that ball. Covering radius is the radius that guarantees always the existence of at least one solution but possibly more than one. Typically, there will be more than one lattice point within this largest radius. So, And this is a problem that also comes up in other areas. For example, uh, so the bounded distance decoding is what you would naturally use uh, in the context of information transmission when you want to send a message. So this is uh, the problem that comes up in vector quantization. You have some uh, point in space, and you want to map it to a point from a discrete set, from a lattice with small distortion. And the covering radius is precisely the best uh, uh, upper bound that you can put on the distortion, no matter which point in space you want to round. So no matter what point is given to you, you can always approximate it with a, with a lattice point within distance big R from it. So, um, so absolute distance decoding is CVP. But uh, um, assuming uh, that, uh, so, th there is, so, in, it is, so it's not really CVP. You are not required to find the closest lattice point to the target. So it doesn't have to be closest. But uh, you are uh, taking an R, a distance R, which uh, is uh, the worst possible distance. Instead of, compare, instead of using uh, the distance of the actual target, you maximize over all, over all possible targets the distance between the lattice uh, point uh, 
And the target, of course, here you are also minimizing over the lattice point and maximizing over the target. And you are trying to find the solution within this absolute bound that says you always find a solution. Now, somehow, these two problems correspond precisely to the SIS, correspond to absolute distance decoding. And in fact, it can be seen as an average case version of absolute distance decoding. And the LWE problem is an average case version of the bounded distance decoding. So these two problems seem to capture somehow the two classes of applications that uh, you can build from SIS and uh, LWE. One is Bayesian cryptography on the harness of uh, bounded distance decoding. And uh, the other one is building uh, functions out of this absolute distance decoding. So a natural question at this point is, how do these problems relate to each other? Can you show a connection between ADD and BDD? And uh, interestingly, we'll see that, uh, I'll show you that it is possible to reduce one to the other. One of them is easier, one of them is harder. And as you can expect, the easier one is the one that gives more applications. Because assuming that the problem is hard is a stronger assumption. It's an easier problem. You still assume that it's hard, and you will be able to do much more with it. So the other one is a potentially harder problem. Assuming that it's hard is a weaker assumption, and you will get a correspondingly weaker class of applications. So and in fact, it is possible to give reductions showing that if you can solve the absolute distance decoding in any lattice, then you can also solve the bounded distance decoding in any lattice, up to some small change in the approximation factor. You can always make these problems uh, quantitatively easier or harder by adjusting the radius. If you make R, the radius in the bounded distance decoding, even smaller than lambda 1 over 2, say lambda 1 over 10, or lambda 1 over uh, uh, log n, some function of the dimension, you can make it easier and easier, saying that, oh, you are even closer to the lattice point. But as far as we know, as long as uh, you are not too far from lambda 1, this seems to be a hard problem. S uh, and similarly here, you can take, uh, you can get an easier problem by using a radius which is a little bit bigger than the covering radius. So, and so if uh, you uh, allow some slackness in the exact value of uh, this uh, uh, to uh, radi, then it is possible to, re to reduce one problem to the other one. And what about the other direction? So in the other direction, it is also possible to give a reduction. But the only known way to give a reduction from the bounded distance decoding to absolute distance decoding involves quantum computation. And I think it is one of the most puzzling uh, uh, things uh, in the complexity of lattice uh, cryptography, uh, because it also raises a number of uh, interesting questions of the form. Is this really needed? Or is there a way to do the reduction classically? And assume we live in a world where uh, the um, uh, you only have this problem. So all you, are, uh, all, all you are allowed to do is uh, to use this SIS problem. And then you can ask, oh, can I build, uh, quant uh, can I build public key cryptography? Can I build pub uh, private key cryptography? And the answer to private key cryptography is uh, yes. You can build the symmetric encryption. You can build hash functions and so on. While building public key cryptography somehow uh, requires that the problem uh, should be hard not only uh, with, cl cl with classical computers, but you need uh, this uh, quantum step to build, uh, to build uh, public key cryptography. So do you need, uh, so maybe there is something deeper going on there. And uh, uh, yes, you can uh, base uh, public key cryptography on SIS under quantum reductions, but uh, you can only base uh, private key cryptography from, uh, for, from SIS using classic uh, reductions. So looking at these problems in this perspective, I think it's something that may somehow also uh, provide in the end a better understanding of the lattice problems uh, uh, themselves. So what I want to do in the rest of the talk is uh, to sketch how the two reductions uh, work. It will be a sketch. I will not provide the full uh, details. Uh, 
but uh, so the reductions are sufficiently simple that uh, uh, I think you can get a pretty good idea of how they work. And uh, so there was, this, this will be the rest of the talk. It's a little bit more technical. Uh, I will still illustrate the reduction essentially by drawing pictures rather than writing mathematical formulas, uh, even the quantum one. So there will be some quantum pictures, but uh, it's, uh, it will be my uh, best. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll use different colors for superpositions. So maybe I'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. OK, so uh, oh, one last important question before we move to the technical part uh, is, uh, what about SVP and CVP? We do not know how to build the cryptography from those uh, problems. Uh, in fact, uh, some of these problems are, are uh, known to be equivalent uh, up to some uh, small change in the approximation factor. For example, the boundary distance decoding is uh, roughly equivalent under classic reductions, efficient reductions to the gap SVP, which means uh, solve the shortest vector problem, but without finding the shortest vector. So gap SVP asks to find just this quantity. You want to approximate the value of lambda 1 without finding the shortest vector. So we don't know how to find the value of lambda 1 without finding the shortest vector. So algorithmically, they don't seem to be much different. But from a complexity point of view, approximating the length of lambda 1 is reducible in both directions to the complexity of the bounded distance decoding. So, um, so this is a bit, uh, this, this is not quite uh, uh, satisfactory. You may want to assume that finding the shortest vector is hard, uh, and not just finding the length. So assuming that even finding the length is hard uh, seems a much stronger uh, assumption. You can get good upper bounds on the length, for example, using Minkowski's theorem. And there is also a special version of the shortest vector problem called the unique shortest vector problem, which is finding the shortest vector in a lattice when it is an usually short, much shorter than any other vector in the lattice. That's called the unique shortest vector problem. And it is also in this category. All these problems can be related via reductions, classic polynomial time reductions. So this is in a work of myself with Vadim Lubashensky from some, I think, 2009, I believe. Uh, showing that th those three problems uh, fall in the same category. On the other hand, the absolute distance decoding can be shown to be equivalent to the shortest independent vector problem, which is a variant of SVP that has to find not just one, but n linearly independent vectors, potentially larger than lambda 1. And I will not get into the exact definition of the problem, but it is somewhere in between. Now, all these problems can be classified into what gives uh, symmetric cryptography or public key cryptography under uh, classic reductions, while SVP and CVP is, are uh, there uh, on their own. We don't know how to build the cryptography from them. So an interesting open problem that I wanted to you know, pose here to this uh, uh, group of people is, uh, oh, perhaps uh, quantum reductions can also help uh, in that direction. Is it possible to give a quantum reduction from uh, the uh, uh, SVP or CVP problem to SIVP or ADD. So the same way that, uh, so, if we, so we can uh, draw uh, a picture of these uh, problems uh, as divided into classes. Okay, let me. So we have uh, in, In this, uh, bottom, in this uh, simplest class, uh, we have a boundary distance decoding, gap SVP, USVP. They all relate to each other. <coughs> and here we have uh, the shortest independent vector problem and uh, the absolute distance decoding problem. And uh, we know how to give uh, reductions uh, in uh, uh, one direction. classically, and we know how to give reduction in the other direction but using the power of quantum computers. And here at the bottom, so these are the classes from which we can build cryptography. And uh, uh, SVP and uh, 
CVP up to approximation factors that can be shown to be essentially equivalent with each other. And we know how to give classic reductions from the top problems to the bottom. And the question it is open. So I use a different color for this one in green. So an interesting question is if it is possible to give a reduction uh, that uh, allows uh, to use these problems uh, to construct uh, cryptographic applications uh, if uh, quantum can, uh, uh, can be used. I mean, uh, giving a classical reduction would be even more interesting, but that's something that I think has received a certain amount of, of attention. At least I tried for a while and I couldn't. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, you can also try. You probably will have better luck. Uh, no, seriously, no, no, I didn't want to discourage anybody by looking uh, for classical reduction, but perhaps the quantum reduction can give you, you know, one more weapon to attack uh, this problem. So see if it's possible to do it uh, is uh, uh, interesting. So the other, the other open questions, of course, are if it's possible to do this uh, without uh, the power of uh, quantum reductions. <laughs> but I guess most people here like quantum, so yeah, it's, yes? These classical norm reductions, are they deterministic or randomized? So they are, I think for the last part, it can be done deterministically. So deterministic, uh, but they are uh, often reductions that make several calls to the target problem. They are not, uh, you know, many one reductions. And also they all lose something in the approximation factor. Typically you lose a square root of n factor. For some of these problems, you can give reduction with a smaller loss. But square root of n is quite common. And whether it is possible to give uh, a stronger reduction with a smaller loss in the approximation factor, so that's uh, a very interesting, a very interesting question to establish a tighter connections between the problems. For some of them, the reduction is very tight. For example, between uh, uh, these two, BDD and USVP. Uh, so the first reduction in my paper with Vadim was showing that they are equivalent up to a factor two in approximation. So what you lose in approximation is very small. And then this, so Damien lowered this factor with uh, um, uh, um, by and when, correct? So he lowered it to square root of two. And uh, I think more it should be possible to reduce it to one, to get a, a reduction between the problems that doesn't lose anything in the approximation factor, but uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's open. So randomness uh, is useful in some reductions if you want to give a many one reduction. There are randomized reductions that make a single call. But if you allow to make uh, multiple calls, uh, I think everything can be done deterministically. Uh, I mean, not no, no the quantum reduction. I mean, the quantum reductions, I guess, they all involve some, uh, yeah, some form of randomness, uh, as you would uh, you know, expect. Okay, so let's get to the reductions. Uh, so we'll only talk about BDD and ADD at this point. So let me remove the list of problems. And I assume everybody wants to see the easier reduction first, okay? <laughs> so uh, what uh, we'll start with is a reduction showing that uh, if you can solve the absolute distance decoding on any lattice, then you can solve the bounded distance decoding in any, not necessarily the same lattice. So we'll use these two problems on different lattices and use this freedom that you can change the lattice to connect the two, the two problems. So the uh, idea is uh, the following. So this is our starting point. So we are given a bounded distance decoding instance, which consists of a lattice and a target point T, which is close to the lattice, is within this packing radius. Sorry. Yes? I'm slightly confused now. So why isn't it just a special case? 
because this one will always return uh, the unique solution, which is guaranteed to be the closest lattice point. In the absolute distance decoding, uh, you just need to find a point within the covering radius, which is not necessarily the lattice point closest to the target. I may give you a solution which is not optimal. So if you add, uh, of course, if in that case, uh, just if you just increase the radius, uh, so that would be the closest vector problem. And yes, so these are both special versions of the closest vector problem. Good point. So, so they are both special versions of the closest vector problem. But what makes this one not a special case of the other one is because by increasing the radius, we are also increasing the set of uh, uh, valid uh, solutions, of solutions which are, uh, of uh, lattice points which are accepted uh, as uh, solving it. So it may be a non-optimal uh, solution. So, um, so geometrically, there is another way to describe the two problems by considering the Voronoi cell of the lattice. The Voronoi cell of a lattice is the set of points which are closest uh, to the uh, lattice point than to any other point. And uh, the, reason, the way these two points relate to the Voronoi cell is that uh, the uh, bounded distance decoding is, uh, I don't know what I did with the green, but oh, here. So bounded distance decoding is the coding within a sphere which is inside the Voronoi cell, while uh, absolute distance decoding uh, is, uh, so the covering radius is, is precisely the radius of the smallest ball that contain the uh, Voronoi cell. And uh, um, I mean, you can also put this equivalently around the target and then ask, is there a point within this ball or within this region? And the closest vector problem correspond to the Voronoi cell. So Voronoi cell uh, is uh, uh, always, the, the, the solution is unique and uh, it is the closest lattice point. The green ball is the closest lattice point, but it does not always exist. If I give you something here, then there will be no uh, point within uh, the green ball uh, distance. While uh, uh, in the absolute distance decoding, I may give you a point which is outside the Voronoi cell. And that's still within the covering radius, so it's considered a, a valid solution. So, okay, so we are given this target T. We want to find a point closest to it. If we simply make a call to the absolute distance decoding, we consider a bigger ball and we may be given a lattice point which is not really the closest. So we may get something which is not what we want. So what can we do? So I mean, you can try to work with approximations. I don't know how to make it work, but um, it's certainly something that uh, is probably the most intuitive thing to try. Oh, first try to find something that is not too far and then try to go from there to there, okay? This is a good idea. I don't know how to make it work. So what uh, I know how to make it work is uh, using lattice duality. And uh, um, uh, if you don't know what a dual lattice uh, is, you can watch some of the uh, uh, videos from the boot camp. We don't really need the definition uh, for, uh, to illustrate the idea. For the purpose of this talk, all you need to know is that every lattice has a corresponding dual lattice which lives in a different space. Think of it as something that uh, is not geometrically connected to, uh, uh, to that. But the lattice, the points in the dual lattice, they correspond to way of partition the primal lattice into layers. So technically the definition of dual lattice is the set of points in, maybe this is too light. Let's, So, uh, so this is the origin, this is a vector V in the dual lattice. So technically the definition of dual lattice is the set of vectors in Euclidean space that have the integer scalar product with all the points in the lattice. So, take, so we know that V scalar product with a lattice is always an integer and this is our lattice L. Now, since this scalar product is always an integer, so depending on which integer you get, so this vector V induces a partition of the lattice into layers. 
all the lattice points that have scalar product zero, all the points that have scalar product one, all the points that have scalar product two, and so on. So it, it is a way to partition your, your lattice into layers. And it is easy to see that the longer is this vector v, the closer will be the layers with each other. Similarly, if the vector v is very short, then the distance between the layers will be large. In fact, the distance is exactly 1 over the length of this vector. Now, this is the idea. So a lattice, a lattice L and its dual, L star, are related by the fact that if one lattice has a short minimum distance, if lambda 1 is small, then this lattice will have large minimum uh, distances. It's not lambda 1. The quantity that you consider here is the one corresponding to the SIVV problem. You can find n linearly independent short vectors. Similarly, if lambda 1 is small in the lattice, no, sorry, uh, we want it to be large. So intuitively, since we want to solve the bounded distance decoding, we are thinking of this lattice as being a good lattice for encoding. So it is a, lar a lattice with a large minimum distance. So think of starting from a lattice with good decoding property and large minimum distance. So here in the dual lattice, we'll have a small lambda n, which means you can find n linearly independent short vectors. And these vectors can be found using an ADD oracle. And they can be found as follows. You start from, uh, uh, just pick any point in space, which is far from the origin, is a distance from the origin at least r, the covering radius. So r, uh, um, or r plus epsilon, just a tiny bit more than r. And notice this that this is the covering radius of the lattice, which uh, is roughly equivalent to this lambda n uh, lambda n star. So the, the, if you want, you can disregard this uh, shortest in SIVP problem and just think of it in terms of a covering radius. So you know that, that this, uh, so, so you, you, you get that far. And you know that you are guaranteed to find a lattice point within this ball. And this lattice point will be non-zero because you went r plus epsilon away from zero. So that will give you a first lattice point here. So once you find this lattice point using your ADD oracle, you can do the same, but this time you pick a point, a distance r plus epsilon from the linear span of what you have already found. So you take something orthogonal to it, and then you try to find a lattice point inside this ball. And so, since, since this ball is disjoint from this hyperplane, you will get a vector which is linearly independent from the first one. I mean, that's where you stop in two dimensions. You have two linearly independent vectors, and these two linearly independent vectors are short. You can find them using the ADD oracle. And each one of them induces a partition of the lattice into layers which are far apart from each other. So if I give you a target t, you can first find the layer from the first classification that is closest to the target. Then you take your next target, let's say this one, which gives another way to partition the lattice into layers. And you find, oh, what is the layer from uh, this other arrangement that is closest to the target? In general, in n dimensions, you will find n hyperplanes, which are closed to the target. And the intersection of these n hyperplanes will be a single point, which is precisely the point close to t. And this way, you found the solution to the BDD problem. So in this uh, last uh, yeah, two minute, uh, I'll uh, want to illustrate how the other direction work. So I'll give a superposition of all the steps of the proof. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> take a couple extra minutes. If you... OK. Nicely. Yeah. So the, uh, the idea, again, is to use duality. But we use it in a quite different uh, way. And uh, the, 
this is our uh, lattice or uh, dual if you take the dual of the dual you get back to the original lattice so which one is primal which one is dual doesn't doesn't really doesn't really matter but let's say that we want to move in this direction this time so here we have a lattice where we want to solve the bounded distance, no, we want to solve the absolute distance decoding problem in this lattice. We want to find short vectors in this lattice. And all I tell you is, oh, if you want, I can solve bounded distance decoding instances for you. So what you do is to say, mm, let's do this. Uh, let's take the dual lattice. And uh, let's see what we can do here. And what we can do here is the following. You can first build a random point in space with, uh, so you can pick a random target here in space T with Gaussian probability. Okay, so take a Gaussian. So often in cryptography, you choose these points at random. Uh, here, instead of taking this point with random probability, what we do is to take a random superposition of all these points. We take a, a, Gaussian, a quantum Gaussian. So we take uh, a superposition uh, with Gaussian probability of uh, our vector t. Now, uh, as you probably know, uh, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So if you, t so here uh, we, I'm using real numbers, which uh, you can avoid by using a fine grid. So this requires infinitely many qubits. So, but that's not the hard part of the problem. You can, you can restrict it to a, to a discrete uh, grid. So assuming you do that, so what happens if you take, so this is a quantum Gaussian, and uh, uh, what happens if you take the quantum Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So what you get is exactly the same thing here. You will get a quantum Gaussian in the dual lattice. Now that's not useful. You could have built that to start with. So what you do then is the following. Instead of applying the quantum Fourier transform on the original quantum Gaussian superposition, first you take this point and you reduce it modulo the lattice. So that means uh, that uh, you only look at the displacement of the point inside the fundamental region of your uh, lattice. Now in quantum, you know, you can only perform uh, reversible transformations, but that's exactly where B BDD helps. So this uh, Gaussian is small enough uh, that uh, if you reduce the modulo the lattice, you can recover the original point using BDD. Okay, so this allows to perform this operation on the quantum to superpositions of the Gaussians. Now, instead of taking the Fourier transform of the Gaussian in Rn, you take the quantum Fourier transform of a Gaussian in this fundamental region. And if you know a bit about uh, uh, topological groups, uh, so this one is a compact group. And uh, the duality theory for uh, groups and Fourier transform says that when you take, uh, uh, so if you have an arbitrary group, you can still take the quantum Fourier transform and uh, you will get a Gaussian in the dual group. But the dual of a compact group is a discrete group, which is precisely the dual lattice. So what you will get over there is a Gaussian, but restricted to the lattice points rather than a Gaussian in Rn. At which point you just need to look at it. You observe it and this Gaussian superposition restricted to the lattice will collapse to a point from the lattice chosen with a probability distribution which is Gaussian. So it is likely to be close to the, close to the origin. And since it is random, if you repeat it n times, you will get n linearly independent points from these Gaussians. And then once you have those points, you can solve ADD just by, just by rounding. 
So that's uh, how the uh, quantum comes in. And uh, it is not known how any other method to make use of a bounded distance decoding oracle. So the fact that, uh, so that's all we can do using uh, BDD, I think, uh, is uh, uh, quite an interesting question uh, in the area of the complexity of lattice problems, especially as it relates to lattice cryptography. Okay, so thank you for your attention. For this reduction, okay. So this is something that appeared first implicitly in uh, Oded Regev's paper showing the harness of the uh, of the LWE problem. So Regev 2005. And uh, that's uh, implicit, uh, and uh, it is about worst case problems. And uh, then uh, there is also a paper by uh, uh, Stelle, uh, Stanfield, Xanaka, and Tagawa showing a similar reduction between the average case problems. The same idea can also be used to show that if you can solve uh, LWE, then you can solve quantum Lie SIS. And that's in this SSTX paper from, I think, 2009. Let's uh, thank Daniele again.